Good morning. My name is Chad Donahoe. And uh, I just, as of last week, entered into my sixth month here at Deer Creek Church on pastoral step. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you're excited because, uh, at least most of you, because uh, I'm excited. I, uh, and it, it's fun to look out and I realize you are no longer a group of complete strangers to me as I'm slowly but surely getting to know your names and your faces. Uh, my pastoral role here, if you wanted to put a title on it, would be community life in the sense that I oversee our small groups as well as um, help newer people connect into the life of our church. With that said, if you are new to us, I would love to meet you after the service. And with that, uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. We are continuing in our series in the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 4 this morning, specifically verses 35 through 41. And often what I like to do is take one of Paul's prayers and make it our own. So my prayer this morning for us, before we dive into the word, will be based on Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's prayer. So Father, this morning we acknowledge you as the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. We pray that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that we may know what is the hope to which you have called us, what are the riches of our glorious inheritance in the saints. Lord, thank you that we are your treasures. And help us to grasp the immeasurable greatness of your power towards us who believe, according to the working of your great might, that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead, seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Father, that is our prayer. So help us to grow in your grace this morning through your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with him in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So there's this theme throughout the Gospel of Mark. And really this theme is by way of a question. And it's a question that everyone must answer. And whether you consider yourself this morning a skeptic or a seeker or a devoted follower of Christ, everyone must answer this question, this theme of Mark. And it's this, who is Jesus? And what does this mean for our life? Because throughout the gospel of Mark, Mark is pressing this question, who is this man? So what I want to do really quickly, I want to do a two minute drill. Okay, so if you, uh, if you don't understand football, two-minute drill is, uh, is when you don't have a lot of time on the clock. You go from your side of the field to their side of the field, hopefully, to score. So what I want to do is a two-minute drill, bringing us up to speed from chapter 1 to chapter 4. And specifically with the question in mind, who is this? So Mark opens his gospel, and he says this, very first words. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel, gospel means good news, of Jesus Christ. And he continues throughout his gospel to unfold this good news. So immediately Mark quotes from the Old Testament. He begins in the Old Testament scriptures, specifically the prophet Isaiah, who spoke of this Messiah, this Savior, this Lord who was to come. And then we find in chapter 1, 
that Jesus steps onto the scene. And what does Jesus announce? He says, the time is fulfilled, meaning God's people knew of the Old Testament prophecies of this Messiah uh, that was to come. They were waiting, longing for this Messiah. Jesus says to them, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is saying, with me, the kingdom of God has arrived. And he goes on to say, repent and believe in the gospel. Okay, now that statement's going to turn heads. And it did. People are wondering, who is this? What does this mean? We see then in chapters 1 through 3 that the, uh, this kingdom of God, the power and authority of this kingdom is manifested in Jesus as he's healing people of various diseases, as he's casting out demons, as he is teaching with great authority. So much so that crowds begin to follow Jesus. But not just crowds. There's also some others who are following Jesus, the religious leaders of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, they're asking this question in a different way. They're wondering, who does this guy think he is? That's what they're wondering of Jesus. And so they begin in chapters 1 through 3 to be, get more and more confrontational with Jesus, which takes us to Mark chapter 4. That's our passage or our chapter for this morning. Before I get there, in the last few weeks in Mark chapter 4, Daniel has been preaching on parables. So, why did Jesus teach in parables? Just keep this in mind. Jesus was not just about gathering crowds. He was about gathering disciples. And so when Jesus would teach in parables, it functioned in a couple of ways. On one hand, the parables revealed the truth of the kingdom of God, revealed Jesus who he was. More and more, these parables would reveal that. And it would be revealed to those who would have ears to hear. In other words, to those who would treasure the words of Jesus. But the parables also acted to conceal the truth from those with hard hearts, namely the scribes and the Pharisees and others within the crowd. It would, the parables would veil the truth of the kingdom so that some who would hear would receive and find themselves in the kingdom. Others would uh, reject this message and find themselves outside of the kingdom of God. So what the parables would do is they would call for a self-examination and a response. So with that, I just want to share a quick parable that was turned on me once. Okay, this was uh, my freshman year of high school. It was science class. The teacher was Coach Schweitzer. He was the wrestling coach. So he, uh, there, there are some teachers that students instinctively know that they can mess with. I will tell you, I found out Coach Schweitzer is not one of those teachers. So he's in the middle of his lecture, and I cannot remember what he was lecturing on. And I don't remember what entered into my brain at the time, but a funny comment that I just thought, this will be great. I'll just blurt this out. The class will laugh. They'll think I'm great. <laughs> so I, uh, in the middle of his lecture, I blurted out what I thought was hilarious, right? And I look to the left, and I look to the right, and nobody is laughing. In fact, they're looking at me like, you idiot. <laughs> I'm like, rut row. So I look at Coach Schweitzer, and Coach Schweitzer, I kid you not, is standing in front of my desk. If, if he's here, let's just say right about there. And I don't remember what he was lecturing on again. I don't remember my comment, but I remember like it was yesterday, his response with gestures. He did this. <sighs> Donahoe? I once had a dog that barked when I didn't want it to, and I shot it. How does that apply to your life? <laughs> yeah, you get it. Right? Examine and respond. The response is shut your yapper. Here's why I say that. Because that's what parables would do, but not just parables. What Mark is doing throughout his gospel is asking the question, who is this? And so with his parables or his miracles, he is 
asking the question, who is this and what does this mean for our life? So the parables painted this and word picture of the authority and power of this kingdom of God. But now what we're going to find in our story this morning is the disciples will experience the power and authority of this kingdom for themselves as Jesus has one heck of a teachable moment for his disciples as he leads them into a storm, which is no coincidence, by the way. And again, the question that Mark is pressing, and we see it in our section this morning. Who is this? What does this mean for our life? So in our story, there's a literal storm that grips the disciples with fear. So what does this have to do with us? Um, lots. Okay. Because we are potentially, or you know, obviously we're not in a boat in a storm necessarily, but life brings us all sorts of storms, right? Figuratively speaking, storms of anxiety, storms of fear, storms of sorrow, storms of uncertainty, and these storms come in lots of different forms. What are the type of things that grip us with fear? Sometimes it's financial worries, wondering will we have enough? Sometimes it is health concerns. We worry, what will my quality of life be like? Sometimes there are, we could call them cultural storms. If you are not aware, let me just uh, state this reality that I think is absolutely true, that Christian convictions are becoming less and less popular in our culture and with that, there are storms that continue to brew, can produce fear and anxiety. The pressure to conform, persecution if you don't, can leave us gripped with fear at times. How about relational realities and relational difficulties? Friendships, dating, marriage, parenting, <laughs> conflicts with others. We fear relational loss. We fear loneliness. What burdens are you bringing in here this morning? Honestly, for Tiffany, my wife, and me, the storms of raising kids grip us with fear way too often. We have four children, ages 16, 19, 21, and 23. At least three of them old enough to go to jail, right? <laughs> One of them not far behind. And we can get gripped with fear so often. Are they going to be okay? Because these are the critical, you know, there's a term for this age group. It's the critical years. Critical years where they're making major life decisions about life and also about faith. Will they be okay? Will they walk with God? And I want to play God in their lives so bad. Doesn't always actually rarely works. But it's so easy to fall into fear and wondering where God is in the midst of these parenting or life storms and to lack faith in God's plan. So in the midst of the storms, what do you do with God? What is your perspective on God? Because when we go through storms, we are prone to doubt God's love. But the truth is, God himself takes us through storms. It's in order to shape us, to grow us. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to work through this passage to see what it holds for us. And I want us to pay special attention to the various questions that are asked within our passage. So with this, verses 35 through 38, again, let's consider the uh, the. the uh, situation that the disciples are in and their reaction. So verse 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side and leaving the crowd, they took him with him in the boat just as he was and other boats were with him and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat. So the boat was already filling, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Okay, so after a full day of teaching, 
Jesus says to his disciples, let's go. And he means from the region of Galilee, across the Sea of Galilee to the other side, where he'll have more teachable moments for his disciples, but that's chapter 5 and on. So, notice that they leave the crowd. Okay, again, Jesus is not just about gathering large crowds. He is about calling disciples, gathering disciples to follow him, which, again, even this should press the question, are you just running with the crowd Or would you consider yourself to be a follower, a disciple of Christ? So they leave the crowd. And then um, Mark then throws in some seemingly irrelevant details in this story. He speaks of the time of day that it's evening, that they took Jesus as he was, that there were other boats that were with them, that there was a cushion in the boat. So it's interesting what scholars do here is they explain that these irrelevant, seemingly irrelevant details are characteristic in that time period of an eyewitness report. Because what we have in Mark is the apostle Peter was in that boat. He is giving Mark the details. Mark has faithfully recorded these details for us. This really happened and it happened in this way that the scriptures give us. Now, any great story has drama, okay? So here's the drama. A great windstorm arose. Okay, so the Sea of Galilee was known for these windstorms, or these major storms. Essentially, Sea of Galilee was about 13 miles long by 8 miles wide. It was a bit of a basin surrounded by some mountains, and so wind would funnel through and whip up Storms that were pretty severe. And and we see here in this storm that the boat is already filling. Okay, so I don't know what picture comes to your mind with a boat, but excavations uh, of that day would reveal that these boats were roughly 26 feet long. So, oh, not quite, I mean, not quite wall to wall, but fairly significant. Um, seven feet wide, so from about this stand to right here, and then four feet, uh, about four feet tall. So to the base of this, I I measured a little bit beforehand. That's why I'm speaking with such authority. So um, so that, uh, that would be the boat. So the fact that the boat is filling with water tells you that this was a fierce storm, that the waves are breaking over the boat. It is filling. Now, some of the disciples were professional fishermen, and they're all freaking out, which tells you how severe this storm actually was. But then we get to verse 38. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Now, wouldn't you love to hear Peter explain this to Mark? Like, bro, you're never going to believe this. He was actually asleep. I kid you not, he's asleep. Now, why, how could Jesus sleep through this storm? Well, I would say a couple of reasons. One, he was tired from the day. One of the things the Gospel of Mark emphasizes a lot is the humanity, not just the deity, but the humanity of Jesus. Jesus was tired. But also this, Jesus had perfect trust in his heavenly Father. Perfect trust, so was able to sleep. Now, the question is, did the disciples appreciate the fact that Jesus was sleeping during this storm? They woke him and they asked him a question that's really not a question. It's an accusation. It's, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? There it is. There's the question. Earlier I asked, in the midst of life storms, what do you do with God? What is your perspective If you're like me, and if you're like the disciples, this question can come to mind in the middle of a storm, right? And I'm, again, talking figurative storms, right? Do you not care that and fill in the blank? Have you ever wondered? Have you ever asked this question of God? God, do you not see? Do you not care? I've asked this many times in my life. There was one time in my life that was pretty pivotal, I would say. This was my first year 
in seminary. And uh, so I, we moved there, and just in time for me to begin summer Greek. Greek is an intense enough class that so just wanted to devote a summer to it. So uh, day one of Greek uh, arrives, and so it's an evening class. It's three hours. So I show up that evening, and the teacher uh, is lecturing actually on how profound the Greek language is, that the whole New Testament is written in Greek, so obviously it's, it, it's uh, pretty important for pastors to have a feel of Greek and know how to handle it. Talked about how various errors and heresies of the church have been decided based on the Greek language, of understanding the nuances. Like, it's a motivational speech in many ways. It was a great one. So class ends. I go home. Tiffany asks me, so how was it? How was day one? I'm like, this is amazing. I'm so thankful we're here. I cannot wait. Day two hits. So in day two, um, the professor begins to lecture, and it's a three-hour lecture, and I kid you not, so he dove into the actual language. I kid you not, I did not understand a word that he said for three hours. I understood his opening and closing prayer, and that was it. I'm, I'm not kidding. So... Keep in mind, I have just moved my family to, to Covenant Seminary in St. Louis. I left a job. I have a plan A. My plan A is to be a pastor in this denomination. That requires a seminary degree. I did not have a plan B. I go home. Tiffany's like, hey, how was the day? I'm like, I don't think I can do this. So I grab my basketball and I leave our apartment, and I go up to the basketball court that's on campus, and I just start dribbling angrily. And then I'm shooting baskets, but I'm not actually shooting. I am chucking the ball at the backboard as hard as I can. And thankfully, it's the cover of darkness, so other students couldn't see me having a complete temper tantrum. <laughs> but I begin grumbling, and my grumbling turns to prayer, and my prayer is actually an accusation. I am asking God, why did you bring me here? Why did you? I felt called. I thought you were leading me. Why did I come here to fail? You have led me here. You've led me into this storm. Ever felt that? Again, when we go through storms, we're prone to doubt God's love. And fear, when we're gripped with it, it distorts our perspective on God. He led me into this, and he obviously doesn't care. But God knew what he was doing. And the moment that I was asking God, where are you? Do you not care? He was actually going to work on me asking this question. Can you trust me? Chad, can you trust me? with one of your deepest fears. Looking back now, I see more of what God was doing. See, I, I, growing up um, from a child, uh, early in my childhood and on, for reasons I won't go into here, I had become convinced that, frankly, I was just stupid and that academically I did not have at all what it would take to succeed. And finally, seminary is going to expose this. I am going to fail. I am going to be humiliated. And God is sovereign over all this. And what does that mean? And recognizing this, when we fear, oftentimes we fear failure. We fear lack of control. But we also fear, we fear um, that what we most treasure being taken from us. Right? And so what I treasured was image, wanting to look good. Um, and boy, it was all crumbling right through my fingers. But God knew what he was doing, asking me, can you trust me? Can you trust me with your core fears? Can you trust me that whatever is the bigger or scarier thing in your life, that I'm actually bigger um, and greater than, than that. But fear is sneaky. Fear, in fact, fear in this way even still sneaks into my dreams. Can I tell you, here's my most repeated, my, my most repeated dream. Okay, don't psychoanalyze me, please. 
Because um, I already have. So it's this. Um, so it's in my dream, it's Sunday morning, and I have to preach. So I show up, and there's two things that are always consistent. Uh, one is I can't find my sermon notes anywhere. And in one particular dream, they were actually up in the rafters, and I was crawling around for them, but they were always out of reach. Oh, so frustrating. The other one is in my dreams, I'm always missing some clothing articles. Uh, so it's, what is it? It's fear, right? What is it for you? What is it, what areas of your life is it just hard to trust God? Because what God wants to do is he wants to take us from lowercase fear, the worldly fears that we experience, to uppercase, capital fear, what the scriptures refer to as the fear of the Lord. It's growth and wisdom that God is our creator, God is our sustainer, and he alone is worthy of worship. He alone is worthy of worship. So, for those who struggle to trust in God in the midst of storms, we need to hear what comes next. So now, let's look at Jesus' reaction to the disciples' question in verses 30. 9 and 40. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the disciples thought Jesus was going to do in this storm. Maybe they thought he would pray, right? But um, you can tell from their reaction at the end of the story, they, they did not expect what Jesus was about to do. Okay, so listen in verse 39. Listen to this next sentence carefully. And he, Jesus, awoke and rebuked the disciples then said, will you just shut up and quit bothering me? I am trying to sleep. I have more important things to do than to listen to you whine like a bunch of man babies. <laughs> oh, wait, wrong translation. I know what you're, some of you are thinking. If you caught this, you're like, man, he really is bad at Greek. <laughs> no. Um, so, actually, I, I did okay in Greek. I just learned to read the textbook. But anyway, that is, uh, that's not what Jesus said. That's not in the Greek. But sometimes we think that's God's character towards us. And Satan wants us to believe that is God's character towards us. But that's not it at all. It's not his character, his heart towards his, his disciples, towards his sons and daughters. Right? Mark tells us, He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Can you imagine being in that boat and what you would have experienced? That immediately Jesus said, peace, be still, and there was calm. It's not that the wind just died down and the waves just kind of slowly dissipated. The understanding of this scene would be this, that it went from complete storm to complete calm like that. But you could have heard a pin drop in the boat. And this one in the boat whom they just called teacher, right, not exactly the right title for him, just did what only God could do. Say like in the Old Testament when God parted the Red Sea. And here's what Jesus is doing. Remember the question, who is this? Jesus has already with the disciples been demonstrating the authority and power of the kingdom as he has been healing people of various illnesses. He's been casting out uh, demons. And now what the disciples experience is he has authority over creation itself. And he just blew their minds. And now it's Jesus' turn to ask some questions. Verse 40, he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Notice Jesus used the word still here. Have you still no faith after all you've heard from me? After all that you have seen me do, have you still no faith? Now, I'm guessing these were rhetorical questions when Jesus asked them. When he asked them, it probably was to make the point rather than to receive answers from the disciples. But if I was there, if my history and my science class would tell you anything, I probably would have blurted out, well, the reason we fear is because we all thought we were going to die, right? And, and can't, we can't we relate to the disciples on this one? 
Because we do have fears in a really fallen world. But what's the most repeated command in the scriptures? Do not fear. Why is that the most repeated command in the scriptures? Get your mark journals ready because I have a profound answer. Because the disciples often feared. And so do we. And what God graciously over and over says to his people, do not fear. Do not fear. I love uh, what Aaron, uh, part of the worship service this morning that Aaron worked in there, the Matthew 6, right? When Jesus is talking about do not be anxious. And if you caught this, uh, one of the keys to it is do not be anxious because your father knows what you need. Your father knows. He knows the storm that you're in the midst of. So these questions, why are you so afraid and have you still no faith are questions of discipleship. See, what God wants to do is grow us in our faith, grow us in our trust in his power and in his presence. If you noticed, Jesus led them into this storm and it was to grow them. So when we are in the midst of storms, we could either ask the question, God, have you forsaken me? Or to recognize what the scriptures want us to recognize, and that is, this is an opportunity to grow in our trust. Jesus wants to produce greater faith. And the key is not that we just muster up more, try to muster up more faith. The key is not in us mustering up the faith. The key is the object of our faith, that we actually serve a God who is, the scriptures say, perfectly powerful, perfectly good, perfectly wise, knows what's best for us. What God desires us to grow into is people of Psalm 46. That was our call to worship this morning, right? Psalm 46. Let me just go through a little bit of this, and I'll paraphrase a little bit of it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, and we could insert whatever fears we have here. And then, if I can paraphrase, God is in the midst of his people. God will help them. Come, behold the works of the Lord, meaning pay attention to God's past faithfulness that we see in the scriptures as past faithfulness in our own lives. But then look how this psalm ends. Be still. Where have we heard that before, right? Jesus, peace, be still to the storm. The psalmist is saying, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Here's a fun fact. The Lord of hosts is with us. It's interesting in the minor prophets, that term, the Lord of hosts, shows up more and more in the minor prophets, the bleaker their, their surroundings get. And here's, it's as if God is saying, or, or the, the, the uh, writers of Scripture are saying, it's, it's the Lord, is, when you think your back's against the wall, remember who the Lord of hosts is. Lord of hosts meaning his host of angelic angels. God's saying, I've got your back. I've got your back. So what are we to do with our fears? Well, probably not grumble and complain to others, but actually to go to God, who is a very present help in trouble. To call out to God, God, do you care that? Fill in the blank. And be honest, he already knows, right? Our Heavenly Father already knows. And he does care. And what's the proof? What's the actual proof that he cares Let's move to the end of the story. Verse 41. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, notice that right before Jesus calmed the storm, the disciples were in fear, right? But now that the storm is over, they are filled with great fear. So they thought the storm was terrifying, but now they're sitting in a boat, 
with one who is more powerful than the storm that they just experienced. R.C. Sproul here makes an observation in his book, The Holiness of God, that the father of modern psychiatry, Sigmund Freud, articulated the theory that we invent God out of fear of nature. We can't control earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, or avalanches. I throw that in because we're in Colorado. Uh, So we invent a God who is more powerful to help us with our fears. Essentially, the thought is this. Christianity is just a crutch to help us with scary things. Sproul asked the question, or actually, before I get to that, um, what's interesting is uh, the scriptures flip this theory on its head because the disciples are now more frightened after the natural storm. Sproul asked the question, why would the disciples invent a God whose holiness was more terrifying than the forces of nature that provoked them to invent a God in the first place? The point is, no one invents this kind of God. No one invents this kind of God. And we're left with one last question. Who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Who is this? Jesus gives us an answer. It's actually recorded in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus called out, one greater than Jonah is here. What did Jesus mean? What I want to do briefly is compare both stories And what we find in Mark is that Mark has patterned his story after the book of Jonah. Let me fly through this. Both main characters, Jonah and Jesus, they get in a boat. In both accounts, a terrifying storm hits. Similar language in both accounts. But the Lord in Jonah, but the Lord Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And in Mark, a great wind storm arose. Both Jonah and Jesus are sleeping during the storm. In both accounts, the sailors in Jonah, the disciples in Mark, are afraid that they are going to perish. Similar wording. And they wake Jonah and Jesus up. In both accounts, a miraculous intervention calms the storm. And in both stories, the sailors and disciples become even more frightened at the hand of God. Okay. Now, with a surface level reading of the book of Jonah and Mark, there does seem to be a difference in the two stories. Right? In the book of Jonah, Jonah cast himself into the sea, into the storm, and then it's calmed. But in Mark, Jesus calms the storm by the command, peace, be still. But I love how Tim Keller, uh, pastor, author of a lot of really good books, I love how uh, Tim Keller puts it here. He explains it this way. In the midst of the storm, Jonah said to the sailors, in effect, There's only one thing to do. If I perish, you survive. If I die, you will live. And they threw him into the sea, which doesn't happen in Mark's story, or does it? I think Mark is showing that the stories aren't actually different when you stand back and look at them with the rest of the story of Jesus in view. Here's his point. Jesus claimed that one greater than Jonah is here. And what we find at the end of the story, spoiler alert, I'm going to go to the end of the Gospel of Mark, right? Uh, what we find is that Jesus did, himself, did, did take on the storm, the storm of sin and rebellion against God. And how did Jesus calm the storm of sin and rebellion? By way of the cross. This is the Gospel Mark began his gospel by saying the beginning of the gospel, beginning of the good news. Here we're at the end. Listen to this good news, the gospel. Jesus, as God, took on flesh so that he could dwell among us, among sinners, because he came to rescue us. And then what Jesus did is he cast himself into the storm of sin By way of the cross, by death on the cross, he died in our place. Colossians says he made peace by the blood of the cross. But he did not stay in the grave. Rose from the grave on the third day, proving that he is God, conquering sin and Satan and death. And where is he now? 
I'm going to give an answer A and B, and if this was a multiple, cho uh, multiple choice test, you should say answer C, both of the above. Where is he now? He is at the right hand of the Father. He ascended. And what's he doing in the, in the ascension? Right hand of the Father. He is ruling and reigning. So where is he? Right hand of the Father. Answer B, where is he? He is with us. What did Jesus tell his disciples? That when he would go to be with the Father, he would send out the helper, the Spirit of God, to be with them. So Jesus is ruling and reigning, but he is also with us in all the storms that we face. And he is never sleeping, doesn't fall asleep on his watch over us. And the scriptures tell us that he will return and that this day will be a day of judgment and a day of salvation. And so the question is, who is this? Because if you are here this morning and you would not claim yourself as a follower of Christ, as a Christian, or maybe you're not sure, I will warn you that the scriptures talk about a storm that is coming. It is a storm of judgment for those who have not lived their life, bowed their knees, their hearts, their minds to Jesus as the Lord and Savior. But there is grace and there is hope. If you are in Christ, what we know is that when Jesus returns, it's a day of salvation where he will completely calm every storm of life. It is the new heavens and the new earth. So in the midst of the storm, the disciples asked, do you not care? They had to wait and see just how much Jesus cared for them by way of the cross. But we have the vantage point of looking back at the cross and recognizing, does God care for us in the midst of the storm? The answer is the cross. Absolutely. Yes. What's the only thing that can calm our fears and increase our faith? It is one who is more powerful than any storm that enters into our life. But not just more powerful. To have a powerful God that's not loving would be scary. We have a God who's perfectly powerful, but also perfectly loving to us. He brings us into storms, but is with us in the midst of the storm. And we'll end with this. We... Uh, read this morning in Romans 8, this assurance of forgiveness of our sins, right? For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and as daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This goes on. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. And listen to this. Provided we suffer with him, parentheses if I can, in the midst of storms. Provided we suffer with him in order that we will also be glorified with him. He brings us into storms. He allows them. But he is, and don't lose these two words, he is with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you, you've assured us we will suffer in this life. There will be storms. Help us to struggle well. Help us to grow. We are too often like the disciples. We are slow to believe. We are quick to ask, do you not care? But thank you that you have proved your care for us by way of the cross. And I do pray for those here that could be here this morning that have not given their life to you. Lord, move, move in their lives. Pray that they would see your glory and the need to respond. Pray for, for those who are in Christ that we would continue to respond, to acknowledge you are ruling and reigning, that you are with us. So in the midst of storms, help us to recognize you are perfectly powerful, you are perfectly good, you are perfectly wise. So we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.